This is Sign My Car. I'm Severin Dehan. The following interview is part of a documentary series on the Belgian Heritage Foundation, located in Brussels, Wisconsin. The Foundation's goal is to promote the Walloon language and culture through their programming and interactive exhibit. Recently, the Belgian Heritage Foundation partnered with the University of Wisconsin to record the dying language and pass it on to younger generations. In this interview, you will meet Professors Kelly Beers and Ellen Osterhaus, who launched the Walloon Language Preservation Project. Here it goes! Can you tell me your name, your position, and what you do? So I'm Kelly Beers. I'm a, a professor at uh, University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire, professor of French, I'm trained in linguistics. I am Ellen Osterhaus. I also work at the University of Wisconsin, Eau Claire in the English department. My background is in linguistics and sociolinguistics. How did you end up falling in love with linguistic and language? That's a good what question. Was your, what, your, what, was your, <laughs> <laughs> what was your path to, uh, to who you are right now? Yeah, I always found languages interesting. In high school, I took French and German. My sister had studied abroad in Japan, and I always wanted to do everything that she did. So I decided I was going to study abroad too. And eventually I went with French. I never really thought that I liked science, but there was something about a systematic study of language that really made sense to me. And once I found a subject that I liked and was able to put kind of a scientific method to it, it just kind of clicked. And you have, but how, how, how did you go from uh, having a passion for language to, to becoming a linguistic at, and, and, pro, and a college professor? What Kelly was just saying really resonates with me too, that in my background, I, I always did well in English and that was, you know, English classes in general and writing was where I thought I would go. And so I, I stuck with English as an undergraduate. But then when I started to look into graduate school, I found out that linguistics was a thing. <laughs> and so when I took my introductory classes in it, it just don't really fell together for me. When, when did you first hear about the Walloon in Wisconsin? How did you come to cross paths with this community? Really just by chance and the magic of the internet. Um, so what happened was I was teaching a French class at Eau Claire and I was going to do you know, a class on regional languages in and around France. And so I was just looking for information on Belgium, just prepping for class. And, and I think what happened is because Google is so smart now, it knows that, you know, I was searching for balloon and it knows I was in Wisconsin. So one of the first hits was this Wisconsin balloon Heritage Foundation. I thought there's no way that there are balloon speakers in Wisconsin. But sure enough, The fact that there is this unique community in Wisconsin, it's a unique part of Wisconsin's culture and history, and the fact that nobody really knew anything about it, there was a lot of interest at the academic level right away. They were very supportive. They said, yeah, go find out more. And so I started making trips over with some students and started meeting the community members. And When yeah. was that? So that all started fall of 2014. And you, how did you get involved with the project? I found out about it through Kelly, who is just a colleague at, at UWEC. Then recently, I was applying to a summer program in Alaska called Collaborative Institute for Language Research. I think I did the name right. Mm -hmm. Co-Lang. And that has to do with documenting endangered and indigenous languages and also working on revitalization projects, which has always been something I've been interested in, but haven't had much of a chance to pursue. And um, this seemed like a good time to to connect a couple of facets of my life. <laughs> and um, we were both able to attend this workshop that that provided us with a lot of resources and, and ideas for how to help out people in communities like this one. Can you describe me what you're trying to do with the Walloon Preservation Project? Our goal is to document and preserve to the extent possible 
the language that is still spoken in Wisconsin today. We are also working with the Belgian Heritage Foundation, who is putting together the exhibit. So we're working with them to create video material so that people can kind of see and hear people speaking the language. So that's kind of an ongoing project is just recording as much as possible. More recently, we came up with a project to create a primer. So a linguistic primer is just a very simple booklet. It'll give some vocab and grammar so people can put together some words and sentences. So it'll explain what the language is, how it got over here to Wisconsin, just to give people an idea of what the language sounded like, some of the humor that's embedded in the language, some of those things that could potentially be lost. So the idea is to have a written record of the language that can be passed down from generation to generation. What is the biggest challenge for you with the Wedding Preservation Project? The biggest challenge we face immediately, we have to be able to write down the language. There wasn't a written version of Walloon until 1900, but most of the immigration happened in the 1850s. So people came over here without a way to write down Walloon. It was just a spoken language. And the writing systems that exist in Belgium are based on French. And so it just looks so foreign to a native English speaker that It, it just creates an obstacle to want to figure out how to, to read the language. So we're trying to come up with a system that makes sense for a native English speaker. And we're working with the community now to come up with that system. Time is not on our side on this project. You know, a lot of the speakers are in their 80s, 90s. So this is something that often takes a lot of time, but we can't, we don't have the time to... Mm -hmm to take the time to do it, if that makes sense. <laughs> it does make sense. <laughs> and if you have any other thoughts on that. We have this situation going on right now where the native speakers are kind of realizing that they're, they're not going to be passing it along for much longer, just, you know, that their children don't speak it. But a lot of that generation of their children is starting to feel, I think, a sense of regret that they didn't speak it more growing up. You know, oh, it's something that my parents and my grandparents did. For younger generations to see that motivation for people who are saying, I wish I had grown up with more of an interest and an engagement with the language, that that's something that can create more of an internal impetus, which is really what we'd like to do is to raise awareness within the community because it's one thing for us for, as outsiders to say, oh, hey, this is cool. <laughs> um, but it's it's another thing to to help people to see the resources that they already have yeah. available. It's right. not already gone. It's not it's, gone yet. There's right. multiple roads yeah. ahead of us. You know, for native speakers of English or even of French, you know, these major world languages, we sometimes take for granted how intrinsic language is to everything that we do, whereas speakers of some of these smaller languages are really faced with a situation where this part of their history and culture is on the brink of you know, dying out. And there's so much history that's embedded within a language and culture. So imagine a tower a circular tower that has windows on each floor and all around the tower. Each window would represent a language, and looking through that window, you can see the world in a different way and have a different way of describing the world that is out there. Losing a language is like closing one of those windows, and you have just one fewer way of looking at the world and describing the world around you. And I really like that metaphor, and I wish I could remember her to attribute it to <laughs> Anything to add? And this is, I, I'm going to borrow somebody else's beautiful metaphor, and I'm afraid I can't remember who to attribute it to. <laughs> But when I was, we were at this workshop that I went to over the summer, we were speaking with members of a community that their language is endangered and doesn't have a lot of support, and they're working hard to create awareness and, and raise support. And, and in the class, we we're talking about how English speakers often tend to view their language is kind of a tool when we talk about it in terms of utility and functionality. And you know, it's useful. It's a resource. And one of these speakers of this smaller language said, wait, so the metaphor that you would use for your language is like 
it's a spoon that you use to stir stew. And we're like, sure, that works. And she goes, that is the saddest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and it broke her heart that that was our metaphor for what English can do. And um, I think that, that that kind of relationship between your language and identity is something that you're only going to realize when you have Mm-hmm. That that restricted community of speakers, and you're going to start to see how valuable it is. Unfortunately, in those situations where it's under pressure, what is the reception from younger generation to your project? In general, when we've come across younger community members, they're pretty receptive to the project in general. There are mixed levels of motivation to maybe learn the language. There's kind of a sense of this language is going to die and there's nothing that can be done about it. So what we're trying to do is show people that there actually are things that we can do to keep the language around in some way. The book is one way of doing that. We're trying to dream big at the same time and think about in the long term, could it be possible to actually revitalize this language? So part of what we talked about this morning with the the Heritage Foundation is working with the schools to get the kids to go through this exhibit that they're creating, get the kids to start getting more interest in this part of their heritage, and from there seeing if we can start building some of these educational programs. Maybe it starts with a small summer camp, and then maybe there are some high schoolers potentially who could be interested in doing an intensive language learning program over the summer. These are all hypotheticals, but we want to let the community know that these are possibilities and that we don't necessarily have to think of this as a language that is necessarily going to die. That sort of model has worked well in other communities, so... You know, we, we don't have any reason to think that it wouldn't work here. I want to follow the project and see what you do. Where do they go? They could email us at wiwillearnproject at gmail.com. We would like to establish contacts in Belgium because eventually we're going to need help with translation. We are amassing you know, audio and video of people speaking Walloon, and we're going to need help translating all of that. So we do need a lot of help, and uh, we could use help from Walloon speakers, even if they are Belgian Walloon speakers, because they can understand each other pretty well. So the, the Walloon speakers here in Wisconsin will occasionally travel to Belgium and meet some of their long-lost cousins and second cousins and talk with them in Walloon, and they can converse just fine in Walloon. So yeah, Belgian Walloon speakers could certainly help us with some of this translation work. We can use help from anyone, anywhere. Is there something that I didn't ask you that you feel like is important? I guess one thing that maybe I should mention is that in all of the work that we're doing, we're trying to make sure that everything we do is supported by the community. We really want this like the book project, even the creation of the written language. We want that to involve the community as much as possible because it is their language. It's not our language and it's not our heritage. We don't want to be imposing anything. We want to make sure that everything feels like it's theirs at the Mm -hmm. end. So you want to uh, contribute to the community and enrich it and you don't want to just be an academic linguistic taking over the language. Exactly. All right. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for making time for meeting with me on such short notice. Yeah, thank thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this time I car interview. To find out more multimedia stories on Belgians living in the US, just go to our website on www.simacard.org. If you like our work and would like to see more stories, please consider making a donation on our GoFundMe page. You will find the link on our website. Have a great day!